we're supposed to be fulfilled. Yes. Amen. So today we're going to show you how to draw out those revelations. It says in Proverbs that wisdom in the heart of man is like deep waters. But a man or woman of understanding will learn to dip it or draw it out. Can you say amen? amen. So, okay. So the word of God has all kinds of revelation hidden within it. In fact, Jesus talked in parables to hide revelation from those that could care less and those that wanted to find fault to those that were eagerly seeking the truth. That's what a parable is for. Because the disinterested won't want to listen to the details of a story. They'll lose interest. But a seeker for truth is going to want to know what that story is going to reveal to what Jesus said. So often he spoke parables so that seeing, many people who could care less and their mind can't control it, won't see. And hearing, they should be listening, or, or just say, eh, I've heard that before. But the serious, those that are really seeking for truth, right, shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set them free. So as believers, we have been given access into a supernatural kingdom of God. This is what we call the secret place. Got to take a sip here. Everyone say secret place. I love the secret place. Amen. Still, there is a moral God who wants us to walk according to the spirit and resist the evil that's so rampant in this planet. Can you say amen? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is the secret place, the spirit realm. This is the place where you and I can go, Satan can't follow. This is a place where we dwell in, hopefully give, him, give God enough time to change you from glory to glory. Still, there is a moral and a, uh, a strong of godliness within our spirit. So the Bible actually says this, and for those, maybe you didn't hear that, but it says over in 1 John that because Jesus lives in our heart, because the seed, Jesus Christ, is in our heart, we cannot sin. Now that is a real opener. What do you mean? I, I, my mind so, sometimes just goes off the deep end, and, and I find my flesh sometimes just rebelling. What do you mean, cannot sin? Here's what it's saying. Where did God come to live? Okay, what, do you, what part of your heart? Two has two chambers, and has an outer part, and has an inner part. Inner. inner part, what part is that? Your spirit, very good. It's your human spirit, and your soul is the outer part. So every time you hear the word heart, it means your soul and your spirit. Say soul and spirit. The outer part of your heart is your soul, and the inward or hidden part of your heart is your spirit. Let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is in the sight of God of a great price, rather than decorating yourself with gold, silver, and prodding your hair and all that kind of stuff. It's out of Peter. Are you still with me? Don't, don't lose me. All right, so within our spirit, I need to say this, there's a check and a balance system. If you are in the word and you're walking with God, like I believe you are, then you're going to get a check whenever you're around things that are dangerous or you shouldn't be or involved in something maybe you shouldn't be. And you're going to get a go sign when you're involved in something God wants you to be involved in. Learn those signs. Can you say amen? That's the inner witness that we get. Hallelujah. All right, so inside of your spirit, you're not going to get angry. So let's say if a person is like one of their temptations, and I have to do this gently, maybe like I had years ago, <clears throat> I would get angry. And I think I got angry because I was insecure and a few other things. And so I would go to God and I would ask him to deal with that. And little by little, he started replacing that anger with, with his fixing and his joy. But you got to ask him, amen? We have not because we what? 
Amen. So our responsibility is to tap into the realm of the Spirit as often as possible to live it out in our daily lives. Still, you and I, I got the hiccup, sorry. You and I um, have to learn the principle of how to draw out what you need. Can you say amen? Now, we have a digestion system. When you sit down to some good food, and you eat the food, and you digest the food, your body has a system where it absorbs it, and it, it sends all the nutrients out to the different areas of your body, correct? Well, your spirit's the same way. We don't. We digest the Word of God. It rubs down our soul and helps us to think right, but also fires up our spirit. And our spirit then begins with our soul, digesting it. And this is the scripture, it's in Ephesians. It says that the eyes of our understanding become enlightened. So we got to get the word in, our spirit digests it, shoots it up through the soul so that we can get an understanding of it. And then we can walk it out through the day. Well, that's why we have what we call a bypass revelation insight to the word. What do you mean? When you receive revelation knowledge from the word, Satan can pick up on it. If God says to Kerry, look at this. Wow, when he first showed me how to hide myself in him and how to stand, you know, we've been talking last week, everybody was talking about making a stand. Well, you make a stand, but you stand up in God. Can you say amen? All right? We stand up in his armor, right? So when you get up in your prayer time with God in the morning, you stand up in God and you walk on in God. Amen? For in him we live and we move and we have our being. Yeah, Danny. Yeah, yeah. If that helps you to, to see what God has made available to you, if that helps you to see it, absolutely. See, God just revealed that to you. Now, I don't, I've never watched a Matrix movie, so it doesn't relate to me, but I can, I can see myself in the bubble of the bubble boy. Do you understand? <laughs> I'm just joking with you. I can see my bubble completely around people who walk with Jesus. That bubble is completely untouchable for the devil. But we don't know it's there until we know it's there. Let me say it again. We don't know it's there until we understand it's available in there. Let me say it one more time. We, a lot of times we might hear that it's there, but it has to be a revelation that it's there. Hello. And like, God revealed something the way Danny could understand it. You see how personal that was? Now, if you've never seen Matrix, no offense or anything, because it's a pretty good movie if you like sci-fi. But uh, if you've never seen it, then you're not going to relate to it. So God will relate to you the way that you can pick up on it. Do you understand? That's why, you've heard me say this many times, but I'll just say it. I don't preach my revelation of how God reveals to me. I just preached the pictures like he did. He shared, it's kind of like this. Oh, yeah. See, it becomes a segment or a, a picture that's set aside to amplify the truth. It's kind of like a parable, but just a picture in this case. Are you, are you say amen? All right. We're going to go to a familiar set of scripture of Paul's testimony in Acts chapter 26, 12 through 18. It's in your notes, but I'll give you a little bit of to find it in your Bible. Another thing I might suggest, if you like studying, you grab yourself some Bible markers and pick up the notes real quickly for about five minutes in and find out where those scriptures are and mark your pages if you want, you know. Uh, we used to, they used to teach us in the Bible study, I mean, in Bible college, to flip the pages. I don't have a Bible up here, but they would flip the pages within the pages and stuff like that so it would all be marked when you didn't have a marker. Just don't crease them. All right, so, all right, Acts 26, verse 12. 
While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, and at midnight, uh, midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, what was I called? What's I called? Being slayed in the spirit. I heard a voice speaking to me, not to the whole gang, to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Goats is like a, a devil's club. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Uh-oh. But rise and stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. Now take note, everybody. To make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you. You see the word reveal there? Very important because Paul was given revelation knowledge from God and Satan wanted to beat it out of him. If you get a chance to read 2 Corinthians chapter um, uh, 11, it talks about the, the perils of Paul. Shipwrecks and being beaten among false brethren. He goes on these, that's where they, they get that phrase, perils of Pauline. Yeah. You know, that's where it originally came from. But, but then you read the next chapter, and it says, because of the multitude of the revelations that were given to me. I'm going to paraphrase. A messenger of Satan was assigned to me. Okay? All right. Now, the way other people read that is because of all of the heavy revies that God had given you, God is also going to give you a thorn in the flesh. It's going to keep you humble. Because we can't get you too puffed up because I'm giving you all this revelation. Sounds like a double-minded God to me. No, Satan doesn't want the revelation out. How hard did he fight against getting scripture out? How, fire, how hard did he fight against the, the church in the book of Acts? Do you think he's lightened up any? The key is, is the word is richer. It's deeper. If you're paying attention to it, it gives you a better idea of your benefits. Can you say amen? If you know there's a lock on your car door, then you can use it. If you don't know there's a lock, then you're going to be guessing. And a lot of people don't search the scripture enough to find out what's theirs. We want to encourage you. And the best way to get it is have God reveal it to you the way it relates to you, like he did Danny earlier. I think that's a great revelation. All right, are you still with me? And God will reveal it to you. And then verse 17 says, and I will deliver you from the Jewish people. Oh, they were such angels, weren't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah, don't pick on the Jews. No. God picked on them. He picked on them because they were religious. They weren't preaching the promises of Abraham. They were preaching the law. And you know what that does? Danny, I know that you did all the... I'm, I'll use me. I don't want to use Danny. Uh, Carrie, I know that you did all these things, and all these things were great, but the law says it's not good enough. You'll never be good enough, the law says. Because if you were good enough, you wouldn't need Jesus. So we all relinquish the fact when we come to the Lord, we surrender and say... No, I cannot do it on my own. God help me. And God says, all right, it's a partnership. Now, how often are you going to require a request of me, my wisdom? Instead, Jesus said, yoke up, hook up to me. Don't even think about disconnecting. Can you say amen? So he goes on further to say, and I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles. They were mean too. To whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light 
and from the power of Satan to God. Remember last week, Sunday service, Father, that they might be one that you would, would bless them as you have blessed me, you know, in John 17 when he, he prays for them. And he says, reveal your word to him. Your word is truth. And he begins to do all that. That was his prayer. And look, Paul's saying the same prayer here. He says that you, it says, um, let me read 28. Come to me, all you that, oh, oops, scoop, wrong 28 there. <laughs> not even 28. Sorry, I get all excited about this. And I will deliver you, the Jews people, Gentiles, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. All right, guys. Sanctification. What is it? Yes, it's being set apart. Is it a process of time? Or is it right away? Both. Both. When you accept Jesus Christ, he moves you out of Egypt. Amen? But then you got to go through the wilderness... And Egypt's got to get out of you. So what it is basically is God delivered us, but sanctification comes from walking with God. We learn what's acceptable, what's not so acceptable as we walk with him. And he begins to comfort us and build us up. And have you noticed there's a quality of contentment you now have with God that you didn't probably have five years ago? Isn't that nice? that you can actually enjoy him and talk with him because he's now become your friend. He always was a friend to you. But now you've relaxed enough to interrelate where you feel comfortable in his presence. That's where the trust comes in. That's where walking with God is such confidence comes in. See, that's me. All right, so my first point tonight is to gain insight into the spiritual realm, like revelation knowledge, Jesus must be first. Everyone say, I know that. I know that. You got that part down, okay? But there's some key notes in this scripture that we've read many times. In Matthew 11, there's some real key things that I'm going to emphasize. Number one, 25, Matthew 11, 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to what? Babes. What's different between somebody that thinks they're wise and an innocent child? What's the difference? Yeah, the child's really innocent. The key is, we're talking about receiving the word. A child will receive the word with no complications. But the wise will think probably, are oh, you sharing the word with me? Let me figure out if you, you're doing it right. And they, they'll get their intellect in, in a way, in way of hearing the truth while an innocent child will accept truth. You see what I mean? And what did God say? We're to be like a child. Yeah, but in this case, but yeah, true. But in this case, the way it's being used here is the wise are only wise in their own eyes. And the innocent are just ready to receive. That's all he's emphasizing there. Sure, we know that a kid can eat poison because they're ignorant. Yeah, but we're not referring to that. This is Paul trying to teach them, hey, listen, God reveals, hides it from the wise and reveals it to the babes. You see how that relates? Hides it from the wise, the people that think they're wise. Jesus said it this way, I do not cast my pearls before the swine. All right? Okay, so he says, people that are wise in their own eyes is the human race, period. And Jesus came along, pow, and plunged himself into that mess and started preaching the truth. Only the innocent, babe-like people started receiving it. 
And all the wise, what did they do? They crucified him. He doesn't fit us. He doesn't, he's not part of this political party. <laughs> Crucify him! They can't trust. You can't trust from your intellect. And about the time you think you know it, somebody will show you that you're wrong. So your intellect really has no foundation other than God in you. Can you say amen? So let's go on past that. So he says, look, at that time they answered, I thank you, Father, that you hidden these things from the wise and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in your sight. All these things have been delivered to me by my Father. And so no one knows the Son. Now listen to this next phrase. Except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And then looks this phrase. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So if you're a full of yourself, you're not going to get anything from the word. But if you're humble and you're hungry, the spirit will reveal it to you. Can you say amen? So have you ever noticed that some people have that term? I know. And you're trying to tell them something that they really don't know, but they're telling you, I know, I know. You should have really done it. Just, I know. We have a whole world full of I know people. And they don't know. And a lot of people are following them. And they're both falling in the ditch. Hey, that sounds like something Jesus said. Amen. Amen. So we want to make sure you don't follow a blind, non-godly person that's trying to tell you how to live your life. Hello? You want to take everything through the lens of the revelation of the gospel and what you know it to be. Say amen, somebody. So he goes on. He says, okay, because you're having problems receiving. He says, come to me, Jesus said. He says, to whom the Son will reveal it. So come to me. So he's telling him, look, I'm going to reveal stuff you've never understood. All you that labor and are heavy laden. Why do people labor and are heavy laden? Can anybody think a biblical reason why people labor and are heavy laden? I know you can, dear. What did God say in Genesis? Because you listen to the voice of your wife, you're going to crawl around and till the dust of the ground and by the sweat of your brow until dust you return. So Jesus says, hey, I got an alternative for you. Come out to me. Let me show you the way it's supposed to be done. You can be a cane and bring your own stuff and be rejected, or you can be an Abel and let God show you how it's done. Can you say amen? I just love God showing me how it's done. Like when working on my lawnmower. He knows more about it than I do. And I know quite a bit. It's always nice to have God lean in and say, God, I need some wisdom here. Can you say amen? Come on all to me, all you that labor and heavy laden. You know, that's part of the curse, isn't it? Laboring and sweating and worrying about your bills are all part of the curse that Adam received because he listened to his wife as she listened to the devil and they both ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, cursed be the ground for your sake. So he says, come to me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will, first thing he offers, I'm going to give you rest. Whew. Oh, man, somebody's got to do it. But see the way that Jesus is saying it in the Greek. He says, come on to me. You'll taste rest deeper and and and." richer than you've ever rested before. Hello. We see examples of that. Daniel in the lion's den. He pulls up a lion and goes to sleep. Jesus in the boat, in the storm. Hello. Amen. God's not going to leave us, see? But it's those lies all through our life that we battle with. That's why we need to be innocent. And we go to the word. You see, 
when we yoke ourselves with Jesus, it'd be great if he was right here in this room. We'd all be gathered around him, guaranteed. And then Joe, he would have his hands around his feet. And I'm not letting go. Right? Amen. But you have it. It's called the word of God. And you need to yoke up with it. The word of God is Jesus, and Jesus is the word of God. In the beginning was the word. The word is with God. The word was God. You've got to get into the word to yoke up with him. Why? Because if you're not in the word, the rest can't come. For there is a rest to the people of God, it says in Hebrews 4. But many don't find it. Where do you find the rest, Pastor Carrie? In the Word. And you've got to have God pull it off the page for you. So that means you've got to spend a little bit more time than you've been doing it. You probably are a residual Christian. You got hand-me-down from mom and dad, you know, and... and and a few things that you learn from church. you got to go in there and dig. Come unto me, the, Jesus said. All you that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Yoke up so I can carry you while you're learning. Yoke up. You see, we know about a yoke. Two animals are yoked together. It's usually an inexperienced animal and experienced animal. You yoke the two together so that the older one teaches the younger one all the ropes of what's to be done. Amen? We yoke up with Jesus so he can teach us the ropes of the kingdom and the right way to do it. Because we can do the right thing the wrong way. We could say the right thing the wrong way. We could misunderstand. Hello. So we go to Jesus on a regular basis. We yoke up with him. We get in the word together. Why? He begins to give us revelations knowledge. And that revelation, that revelation knowledge gives us the specific insights that we need for the day, for the week, and for our life. Very important to have revelation knowledge. Okay? A couple of thoughts as we read on. Okay, and then he goes on, for I am... Gentle and lowly in heart. Okay? And you will find, you have to look for it, rest for your souls. That's your mind, your will, your emotions. You know, sometimes we just get dog tired. Our mind is kind of wearing us out. You go to the Word. You go to God and you just bathe and soak in His presence. And that peace takes over. Right, right. You don't, want to, you don't want to involve your mind because, believe me, this whole statement I probably use a lot is that once you get God figured out, now it's, he's too small to really deal with your problems. You see, we're not made to figure God out. We're made to trust him. We're not made to cry out and worry. We're made to know that he will provide for us. We're made to realize that what he said he will do, what he promised he will bring to pass. The whole idea of us being nervous and everything means that we haven't hooked up enough. Don't get under condemnation for it, but rather hook up a little more. Amen? How many are got up this morning with a smile? Just glued. Some of, you, some of you might get up singing a song. You might get up weeping or crying. Tears not always negative. You know, I, I weep a lot, but there are tears of joy. When I mention God and I get all gooey, I start to weep and, and stuff, but it's tears of joy. They're not, I'm not sad about anything. Certainly, if I was going to be sad about everything, you know, it would be my past life, but God has forgiven me. Not, not to make light of it. Another thing is, on that same light, well, see, 
well, you could just go out there and do whatever you want. God's going to forgive you. Well, you just really don't understand God. Once you spend quality time with God, the last thing you think about is doing something wrong. It doesn't even reach your mind. And then when you go to about to make a mistake, you know, you just don't know any better. God speaks right up and says, no. Amen. But you've got to spend the time with him. You've got to do that so that God can activate that spiritual realm and the spiritual realm that lifts revelation knowledge off of the page of the Bible. Okay, are you with me? A couple of points. Number one, to get or to receive revelation, Jesus must be first in your life. And, of course, he's first in your life. Amen. And number two, you must hunger and thirst for being right with God. That's why I meet with him every day. I know even at in, in, in night, my body's, who knows where it's at, while my subconscious mind is sleeping, you know. You wake up in the morning, and the first thing you want to feel like is you feel like you want to be dosed with God. How many here know you could have night sweats, wake up in the morning, and you don't smell very good? You know? Amen. So you don't want a night sweat. What you want is a night saturation of God. Can you say amen? You get up in the morning, so we know that we need cleansing. Can you say amen? Just the natural flesh even though you haven't done anything wrong, produces a stench, folks. It does. So you, even if you haven't sinned or anything, but you know you haven't really read your Bible and you haven't really prayed, you haven't really, and I'm not talking about being religious here, you're just kind of going on, eventually your flesh will start putting out that rejection thing. So to avoid that, you just meet with God. When you do that, you don't even have to worry. But guaranteed, I don't, I don't, I, I, I guarantee people that have, um, like they'll get an attitude and they'll keep that attitude for two or three days. I mean, I can't imagine it, but they'll just have an attitude. Maybe they're mad at their spouse or some situation. They won't let it go. I've had people mad at me for years. And actually, some of them died of cancer. And it's, I wonder how much that plays a part of not forgiving somebody. I really wonder. I don't know for sure. I can't guarantee anything. But I do know I want to be with God all the time so my body doesn't any, do any freaking or getting sick or stuff like that as much as possible to be healthy. And I know the healthiest person that I know is God, right? So I want to hang out with that healthy person. I want to hear his wisdom. I want to hear his insight. Even if he has to chastise me like we learned Sunday, it's all going to be good. It's not going to hurt. You mean uh, I've been doing that for years, Lord? You mean I've been doing that all wrong? Yeah. Well, come you telling me now? I've been trying to tell you for years. <laughs> you, finally, <coughs> excuse me. you finally got to a place of hearing what I'm saying to you. <laughs> so just to make light of things. If we meet with God on that regular basis, it makes so much, so much things better. How many can attest to it? Amen. All right, so let's go on. So do you hunger and thirst after God? Seek and you shall. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you, all these things. Amen. So let's go to my next scripture. It is your privilege given by God to know God's word, and to understand what he wants to reveal for your life. Did you know that's a privilege and a promise to you? I was told years ago, oh, Christians don't have any privilege. Free choice. <laughs> See, there's a, people will pop off of things, but they have no reason behind it. Sounds like today, doesn't it? They'll pop off, oh, yeah, that's the way it is, and then find out later it's not, you know. Depends on who you listen to. All right, so it's our privilege, God-given right to know God's word. Say amen. You know, and this is, I can testify about me. I'm curious, and I am analytical. So when I would see miracles, I, would, I went to a Bible study, just a small church Bible study, where every time we met, there was a miracle that happened, kind of like here. 
And so I started wanting to know how, why. And so guess what? I started asking lots of questions. I didn't assume that I knew. I wanted to hear from the elders and, and Pastor Sires how this works, how to get the anointing to transfer through your hand. And all of these scientific things, doesn't sound real religious, but these scientific things. And you know what? God, the more I started inquiring to God about it, the more he started revealing to me. Now, he'll reveal to you what you need to know for your walk and then listen to me and build you up for your talk. Your walk is first, your talk is second. Hello? But we have the opposite. We talk a good talk, but our walk is not so hot. Now, you work on God working on your walk, and then you'll have a lot to talk about. Can you say amen? Boy, it's quiet in here. <laughs> Bless you. I'm not trying to pick on you, but I'm trying to get us to understand. So God's giving the privilege and insight to his word. Can you say amen? amen? Go, Matthew 13. Listen to what he said about parables to his disciples. Matthew 13, verse 10 and tw through 12. And the disciples came to Jesus and said to him, Why do you speak to them in stories or parables? And he answered and he said to them, Because... It has been given to you, for you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It sounds like he avoided the question. Why are you speaking to them in parables? And then he says to them, but it's been given to you to know the mysteries. He answers it a little later. For whoever has, to him more will be given. To whoever has not, what's the rest of that say? Even what he thinks he has will be taken away. And he will, okay. And so we, of course, I left that part out. But the more you receive, the more abundance you'll have. Can you say amen? All right, a couple of points underneath that. The word mystery, we know what it means. It's the Greek word mysterion. It's a transliteration. In other words, they had no Greek word for it. So they moved it out of the, the Hebrew and out of that realm put it in English words. It simply means a teaching that is given only to a certain people who've made the initiation. Did you know that? So if you know anything about Masons, you have to be initiated in order to get the in the club. Maybe if you were like me, I had a little camp club when I was younger and you got initiated like you had to kiss a frog or, or something like that. The initiation allows you to be part of the group. Now listen, how does that relate, Pastor Curry? Because that's what that word means. So how do we become part of the group? When we get born again, now we're part of the group. And the mystery teachings that were hid from people in the Old Testament are now revealed to us by his spirit. So that we might know the things that are given to us by God. So we can be inquisitive. Lord, I want to know what areas I need, you need to work on me about. And I'm, don't freak me out, God, but I need, you know. And Lord, I need to know what areas could I, you know, that I need to study that might help me a little more wisdom and get God's personal information on it. You can't walk my walk, nor the things God tells me not all of them are going to relate to you. So you got to know. So i got to tell you this story. I used to know somebody years ago that God would get on their case and give them a sermon. The sermon was for them. But because they were wherever they were, they thought God gave that sermon for everybody else because they needed it. Hello, when God tells you something, it's not for somebody else. Hello, it's for you. And usually in a sermon like this, because this is a minister, when God shows you something like that, he didn't want you to run out and preach it because you don't know enough about it. Anybody can read off a paper. That's why I wonder, you know, at times, you know, where are you at? Well, I'm not going to sit and read off a paper. I'm going to teach you the word. But I will read off the paper. Do you understand? And... It, 
you know, it's just, just one of those things. So you got to realize that the Spirit of God wants to be personal to you. So what he reveals to me, okay, is going to be to me, how is that going to relate to you? So then there's a time also he reveals things that you can do for your marriage or you can do for your relationship or you can do for the ministry or for your job. Can you say amen? But remember, if God gives you a sermon, don't go running out there thinking that everybody needs to hear it. You check yourself with it first. Are you lining up with that? Hello? You get a sermon that says, and God gives you a second chance. Well, he'll give you a third, a fourth, a fifth, seven times 700 chances. He never stops giving you chances. He wants you to realize, hey, do something about you falling down all the time. You know, nowadays when you're our age, first thing they tell you, have you fallen? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yeah, I used to just, I look at my wife and say, no, and I, have, I would say, answer before they asked the question. No, I haven't fallen. <laughs> but I fell in Adam. But Jesus came and he rescued me. All right, let's go on. So the mystery here is a transliteration. It means that God has a secret teachings by the Holy Spirit revealed to each individual believer that will help them in their walk and help them get the gospel out. Someone say amen. amen. Two, you and I got born again. We became separated from the world and initiated unto the master's use. So we better get in the word and find out what he wants. And three, there are truths hidden in the Old Testament, but revealed in the New Testament. Do you know what some of those might be? You ever thought about what they might be? Some Old Testament things that were hidden, that they didn't teach. One truth was that God would dwell in man. Okay? The mystery of godliness, of God coming down and dwelling in man. They knew it could happen, but they didn't know how it could happen. The rapture was another mystery that wasn't taught in the Old Testament. It was alluded to, but you know, in the Old Testament, unless you talk directly to some of those people, they didn't get it. Look at the disciples. Understand what I'm saying? Oh, bless their hearts. You ever felt that way with God? God's trying to tell you something. You're going, oh, I better write this down. Anyway, let's have a good laugh, everybody, all right? Thirdly, there are truths hidden in the Old Testament but revealed in the New by the Holy Spirit. What's the difference between a believer now in the New Testament and a believer back then in the Old Testament? Were they saved? Yes, they were saved in the Old Testament. But what's the difference between a New Testament believer and an Old Testament believer? We have the right to get born again. Jesus, like, uh, like Amanda said, we have Jesus dwelling in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen? So back in the day when you're reading in the Old Testament and you're reading along, and it says, and God was in Gideon. You know, dun, 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 and you go, well, how come it says in Gideon here? And Jesus hadn't died and rose again. How could it be in Gideon? In Gideon's assignment. God got involved with Gideon, not God into his heart. Hello? Samson. It's another example. Whenever he got close to God, things happened. And whenever he did his own thing, he got his hair cut. <laughs> we won't go any further than that. You know, so you think about all of that. All right, so the last thing again, there are truths hidden. Can you think of any more truths that weren't, weren't in the Old Testament that were revealed in the New? Can you think of any? Let's see how you do. Nope, they didn't know what Isaiah 53. They didn't realize that Jesus really had to die. There's a couple more. Daniel, uh, the, 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 the 70, uh, 70 weeks, Daniel, uh, visited, uh, 
Yeah, the revelations and all the, all the prophecies and dreams of Daniel. Yeah, very good. Hidden. And only the, the, the only way to know what they meant was the Holy Spirit had to reveal them. So think about it. We've got it made in the New Testament because we have to have the Holy Spirit in us as well as around us, right? So if you're lacking information, it ain't God's fault. Excuse my language. It isn't God's fault. It's the fact that you need to get on yourself and, and your case to get in there and get after some things so God can work with you. James 1.18 says that God brings us forth from our old life into our new life by his word. Read it. James 1.18. So if we're not in the word, how can he bring us forth? All he's going to bring forth is the one you want to crucify. You know, the flesh. You've got to have the word in you for him to bring it out of you. Hello? Okay, moving right past that. Colossians, look, listen to what this says. We're talking about revelation for how to receive it from the word of God. Colossians 1, 24 through 28 says, of which I become a minister, Paul says, according to the stewardship means the, that responsibility given to him from God, which was given to me for you. And then he says to what? Fulfill the word of God. Did you know that Paul was chosen by God to give something that the Gospels didn't give? We have a lot of letters from Paul, don't we? And here he says in this one, Colossians, that the word of God was not complete until the revelation God gave me on the road to Damascus where God revealed to me the rapture, the resurrection, all these truths that were hidden in the Old Testament, God revealed them to me. And one of the truths was that God loved the Gentiles and he was going to save them and that Paul was called to reveal the gospel to the Gentiles, to fulfill the word of God, he says. Boy, that's something, isn't it? All right, so he says, and to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery, teachings for the born-again believer, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28 says, him we preach, Jesus we preach, warning every man, teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul was asked, you know, Tell us about what you know. And Paul says, I saved to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hello? Amen. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, they desire wisdom. But those who are childlike, the salvation of Almighty God. Can you say amen? All right. So the Holy Spirit monitors our earnestness. Did you know that? When you ask a question, how do you Really earnestly want to know the answer? I remember when I was um, the Green River Community College Bible answer man for three years. And you know, college students have some pretty bizarre questions. Hello? And a lot of times they'll ask the question to trip you up or trick you rather than they want to know the answer. So I, I ended up saying, hey, why do you want to know, why are you asking the question? And if they fumble around, I says, hey, write it down or whatever. But there would be those legitimate people that would have those legitimate questions. And it was so fulfilling to be able to have the answer to share with them so their lives become better. Can you say amen? All right, so the earnest expectation. expectation. So in a service like this or Sunday morning, the Holy Spirit's there monitoring where our heart is. How bad do you want to know? How bad do you want to be with God? And the Holy Spirit will minister and bring you to that place. Now, if you come to church and you argued with the wife and your head somewhere in, the, in some restaurant somewhere or your favorite food and you got to think of this responsibility, what you got to do in 10 minutes, you're not going to get anything. You're just not. You have to purpose 
that you're going to get and receive from God, like Mary. Can you say amen? At the feet of Jesus. Okay. So John 15, 26 says, But when the Helper, the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I, Jesus said, will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of what? Me. Do you know what that means? That means that the Holy Spirit's job is to point you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal Jesus to you. The Holy Spirit won't, won't say anything like this. I'm the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to me. I'm God in the earth. <coughs> if you ever hear a prophecy like that, shut it off. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't talk about himself. Hello. He talks about Jesus. He points us to Jesus. So if you think your Holy Spirit's talking to you, be careful because the Holy Spirit's job is to get you into the Word, get you on the trail again if you fell off, get you back on the path, keep you pointed to Christ, keep you pointed to Christ. That's what his job is, to teach you about Christ. But he will not brag on himself. He won't separate himself from the Father and from Jesus. His job is to testify of Jesus Christ. Say amen, somebody. All right, so John 16, 13, and 14 says, However, when the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Let me clarify all the truths you need to know for your solid walk and your way to talk the gospel. How many here know that glossolia means language? In 1 Corinthians, at the end of the chapter of 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about a different set of gifts of the Spirit. And one of them is tongues. But that tongues is not talking about talking in unknown tongues. That's talking about glossolia. You notice doctors can talk to doctors much easier than it is to talk to patients. Yeah. And truck drivers can talk to truck drivers. Yeah, they have their own language. So that particular scripture there, I believe, but I, I, I'm almost convinced that Paul's talking about the different varieties of the lang natural languages and expressions of certain people can reach certain people, while other people can't reach those people. Do you understand? And other people can reach certain people, while other people cannot reach those people. So God put the gift of tongues in the body as it pleased him on that. That's not speaking in tongues. That's not your prayer language. That's not interpretation of tongues. That's having a different personality with a different set of words and personality that you use where you can relate to the people that are in your groups. Doctors with doctors, lawyers with lawyers, uh, uh, fishermen with fishermen. And Paul says, I've learned to be all things to all men, whereby I can reach some. So sometimes we can get hung up and that we're a, I'm a drummer. And if you don't drum, I can't relate to you. Well, that's not what I'm saying. You relate to people as often as you can and realize if they're not saved, the one thing they need most is God. Making sure that they're on their way up. Can you say amen? All right, let's continue on. He will guide us into all truth, for he will not speak in his own authority. See, he won't draw attention. The Holy Spirit will not draw attention to himself. But whatever he learn, excuse me, he hears, he will speak. Talking about prophecies, things that come. Look at John the Beloved there in the book of Revelation. These things were, were revealed to me. And he will tell you things to come. Here, let me caution you one area. Don't ask the Lord, how am I going to die? Don't be stupid enough to ask him that. I know several people that did, and there was space in heaven for about a half an hour. God's not going to tell you that. Huh? Because if he told you something like that, the devil would. 
You'd be looking for the opportunity when that's going to happen. Duh. Yeah. So when you ask God, said, Lord, I know that you got things in your hands, but Lord, I know that you've laid out a good path for me. Begin to reveal what that path is. That's what he's talking about. He's not saying, God's going to reveal what's going to happen to the country. Listen, you are too insignificant for God to reveal something that great to somebody like you. Now, don't get mad at me for saying that. Now, if you were a leader of some big degree, then he might choose to lead you and give you some information that way. But if nobody knows who you are and you're a little peon, okay, he's not going to reveal how to change the world to just you. He's going to reveal it to many, many more because it's easy to write just any one person off. But see, it doesn't just do that. He gives us the truth, Danny, Denise, and then he says, if you'll preach it and share it, I'll work miracles. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands, you know, they shall uh, handle the serpents, drink any deadly thing, and they shall lay hands on the sick, right? And it says they went about everywhere preaching the gospel with signs following them. We preach the word, signs will follow you. You preach your own opinion, nothing will happen. Preach the word. You notice that, and I noticed, that I have more word for answers than I do my opinion now. When I first started preaching, it was a lot of Carrie's opinion and some word. Hello. That means that the preacher knows very little but talks a lot. Then when we grow up a little bit, we know a tremendous amount, but talk very little and right to the point. Can you say amen? Thank God for clarity. All right. Yeah, the one word, God. All right, so let's go on. All right, so, so guiding us into all truth. So there's three points under that. How that now that you and I are born again, the Holy Spirit lives in us as well as dwells around us. What are we going to do with that? Yeah, walk with him, talk with him. God, I mean, man, we're in the New Testament. God has never had a time other than in the beginning in the garden where he's walked and talked with man. And he's right here. And I wonder, if, this is my opinion, if God doesn't scratch his head and say, why aren't you guys talking to me? If I was there physically, you would, you would knock down people to come to me. But I'm more than physical. I'm here in the spirit where the devil can't interfere. Why don't you talk to me? So I can almost hear that haunting words going out through all the world. Come talk with me. Come sit down. Let me share you the mysteries. Boy, that just, when my pastor told me that, I, I started waking up and saying, God, today's an adventure. It's an adventure because you're in it. Today's a good day, Lord. Rain or shine because you're in it. Because you're in it, I can have joy. And because I walk with you, I can have health and peace. And you start acknowledging all that, man, you'll get happier than happy can be. That is if you believe it. Secondly, we need to ask, seek, knock. Can you say amen? And then allow God to guide us into the truth. In order, when a door opens, you got to walk through it, don't you? And he says, you'll knock. And the door will be open. But there's also a passage that says he'll open doors that no one can shut. And he'll shut doors that no one can open. Put them both together and the door God opens for you, walk through. The door God shuts for you, leave it alone. All right, so then he goes on. Thirdly, we bear, God bears witness with us. That's what Joe talked about two weeks ago. 
how he can sit under the word and the anointing will go zap, zap. That's the witness that's inside of us that bears to the truth. Amen. And we need to know it when it happens. Used to be a lady, and you guys know, I won't mention her name, in Puyallup. She had a little church building in the back of her yard. And she was as flaky as a $3 bill, bless her heart. She loved Jesus. But her normal social life was just a wreck. You know, she didn't know if you're coming and going. She didn't know how to handle a, a normal conversation. But when she shared the word with you, the power of God was in that word. So I don't know if she was dedicated, you know, and the later on walked off and just kind of flaked out. Back in the, the years, 40, 50 years ago, when the gospel was just coming out and there was a lot of moves, there were a lot of charlatans. And they had results. They had miracles happen. But they used tricks. And there was a guy named, I, I don't know, Margil. And the parents used to paint this paint when it first came out, that when you sweat, the paint appears. And when you get cool, the paint disappears. And this is when it first came out, so they'd paint a cross on his forehead. And when the little kid do his song and dance and everything, the, the little thing would, the cross would appear, and then he'd open his mouth and start preaching, and people start getting healed. See? And I asked the Lord about that. And he says, all they need is to focus on me, and I'll heal them. Now, if the person is a charlatan or using a trick, if that person's innocent and still focused on Jesus, they're going to get something, even though they might be in the midst of a bunch of hula, you know? And the idea is, so you could go to a dead church, and you could get something good, because you're not going to pay attention to the hula. And you know, a lot of that's happening today. I'm going to say this. Please don't get mad at me. But there's a lot of sensationalism out there where people are doing their programs and selling their books and doing all that. And they're doing it on sensational things. You know, and I won't mention anything because I don't want you to think what I'm referring to. And so people will run to something that sounds sensational. But, you know, a circus is sensational, but there's no truth there. You see what I'm saying? And so we can come out and be sensational, have the greatest TV program and preach the greatest message and walk off with your secretary somewhere because it's not something you're living, it's just something you're doing. We don't want us to have that. You've got to have more substance in your walk than in your talk. Say amen, somebody. All right, so let's go on. We're going to finish up with you. If I, I'm, I want to make sure I don't go way over here. Okay, so... All right, so the anointing to know. Everyone say there's an anointing to know inside of me. Say it again. There's anointing to know inside of me. His name is God. Now, does God know everything? Does he know everything that pertains to your life? So he knows how to bring the truth off of the page and off of what's spoken into your life by the Spirit. Does he not? And so, here's what the Scripture says about that very thing. 1 John 2, we're going to start at verse 15 through 17, and then we're going to go down to some key Scriptures, okay? Bear with me. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Now, a lot of people look at that as a slam. Oh, I got, you know. No, what it's saying is, don't occupy your knowledge or your attention on the worldly things because it has no eternal knowledge to help you. Everyone say, I got it. I got it. So do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It shows the separation between the flesh and the spirit. Double-minded, double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let him not think he will receive a thing from the Lord. James chapter 1. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, I'm somebody, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lusts of it. But he who does the will of God abides how long? 
So it was important to pay attention. So now he's going to show you how you can get what you need from the word. Remember John the Beloved, they couldn't kill him. So he knew something possibly he could pass on to us that we need to know by the Spirit. So in 1 John 2, 20 and 21, listen to this. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. Say, that's me. that's me. And you know all things. Stop right there. Know all things. How many here can honestly say you don't know everything? Go ahead, raise your hand. But you know where the one lives who knows everything? In your spirit. Doesn't he live in there? Does God know everything? Is God smarter than you? So before you launch out in anything, ask him first. Might be a timing on it. Might be a way to do it that you're not aware of. So, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Now, who can quote 2 Corinthians 5.17? Just for a minute, underline the term all things. Everyone say all things. All things. Now, I'm going to say this to you because it's, it's fun to say it. All things, certain times in the Bible, don't mean everything. Can you say amen? If it says all things that pertain to the lake, then it's all things that... Yeah, all things that pertain to the bicycle means all things that pertain. But it doesn't mean all things, does it? So when it says all things that pertain to life and godliness, it pertains to what? Life and godliness, not car wrecks and airplane crashes. So when it says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called to his purpose, the deeper meaning is, sure, God can take a tragedy and he can bring good out of it. Sure, look at our lives. But that scripture means something deeper than that. It means that the good things that God has deposited in your spirit will churn and work every day of your life to bring you into a greater walk with God. So therefore, the all things that pertain to life and godliness that are inside our spirit are working together for our good. So no matter what we experience outwardly, inwardly, we are, God is working for our good. So you say, well, if he can bring good out of bad, how does he do that? By bringing good out of you. We overcome evil with what? So quote me, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Very good, you guys. Old things have passed away and... All things become new. Does that mean everything? Well, no, your head didn't become new. And your flesh didn't become new. It's talking just like what Danny said. I didn't know if it got on the mic, Danny. but All things that pertain to life and godliness, all things become new. So God put a package inside of your spirit with him, the Father, and the Holy Spirit inside of you. And they're working for your good. Now, are you in the way of that? By thinking things out in your own life, doing things without being asked, walking around, stumbling around, worrying about things? Or can you step back and let the good in you work to promote you? And that's what God meant. Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I'm easy and I'm gentle and you find rest, you, I didn't quote it quite right. But now in the New Testament, we come to him out of an action of an adoration. First of all, he came to us first, didn't he? First he loved us, and then we loved him. So he came to us, he's in our heart. But it takes us and our will and bringing ourselves before him. 
That's what he's talking about now that we're born again. We still have to bring ourselves to God to meet with him on a daily basis so that we don't run off doing our own thing and blaming it on God. And everybody can see, boy, you're not following God because your life's a mess. Hello? Now, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but our lives become a mess because we listen to the mess maker. He's a crazy person named Satan. And if you listen to him and you get in the flesh, your life will turn into a mess. I don't care how good you are. Even if you're rich and you seem to have it together, you will oppress people and do wrong things. Why? Because it takes God in us to be good. It takes God in us leading us to amount to anything. Jesus says, you are nothing without me. And you can do nothing without me. So, hey, I accept that. And say, well, okay, if I can't, then let's shoot me, God. Please help me. So now you understand that you have God on the inside of you, and he's more than willing to suck off of, the, off of the revelation knowledge out of the word of God. came out of my mouth real different. He's give you that revelation. He's so eager to do it. But where's your mind at? Look at verse 27, 1 John 2. Listen to this. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you. Where does it abide? In your spirit, in you, not in your head, not in your flesh, but in your spirit. And you do not need that anyone teach you. Oh, we just throw the pastors away. No, no. We need everybody. But this anointing will bring out what you need to hear from anybody. He will even teach you what not to do by observing somebody doing something foolish. Hello? You see me do something foolish? You can say, what not to do? Instead of going, that was foolish. Hello? So let's look at this. So that same anointing will teach you concerning the th all things. That anointing will teach you concerning all things, all things. What kind of all things? All things, everything? No, all things that pertain to life and godliness. And the life and godliness that's important to you is what relates to you personally. So you have an anointing inside of you just waiting to show you things, but you've got to get your face in the word. You've got to get your heart into seeking after God so he can show us. Say amen. Now, and that same anointing will teach you concerning all things that is true and it is not a lie. Just as it has been taught you, you will abide in him. Then the last thing the Holy Spirit always does is tries to keep you connected to God. Amen. Constantly trying to keep you connected to God. Come on, let's pray a little more here. You can do it. The Holy Spirit's always coaxing us back to grow and develop. Can you say amen? But we don't grow it and develop till we sit down in the presence of God. Because it's the sun that brings out the fruit. It's not circumstances. All right, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to man. But to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks. Where's that word? Hidden. <coughs> Hidden teachings. Hidden teachings. So you're going to pray in tongues. Often as you pray in tongues, you're bringing out of the well hidden teachings up into your eyes of your understanding. Now, you might not get it right away. But he'll bring it up and then it'll mold around in your thinking and about maybe the next day as you're dwelling, wow, that was really something. Suddenly, bing, 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 it comes to life. Hello? God's so willing to do that for us. But will we sit down and give him the time to do it? Well, it seems like when I sit down with God, nothing really happens. That's because your mind's everywhere but where it needs to be. That's the only reason. I had a guy say to me, well, the first time I was told to go right down to the end of the hallway and just sit with God in his presence, 
I didn't receive a thing. And then the second time I did it, I didn't receive a thing. Third time I did it, rece- then finally I started receiving something. Well, let's just get through all of that mess. Go down there and get your head into God first. Not on what you're going to cook for dinner and where you're going to meet and how many friends you're going to make. You go in and sit with God. Don't be thinking about anything, but God, operate on me. Make me into something. Besides, the world wants to make me into a mess, you know. All right, so when you speak in tongues, your private prayer language, you're bringing out wisdom. So pray often because your private prayer language is the tool God gave you to fan the fire, to build the mysteries and revelations, to build you up, okay, to strengthen you, to help give you insight and to bypass Satan's listening ability to your complaints and your moans. Then 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, uh, Therefore let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Because the Spirit of God is far smarter than us. So listen, when you're praying in, in, in the Spirit and you're praying in tongues, and maybe some of you haven't, but I mean, try praying about 30 minutes straight in tongues. And every time your mind wanders and your tongue wants to cease, Start it up again. Just keep on going. Keep on going. Now, what you're doing is you're pulling out of the realm of the spirit, wisdom, and revelation. But it won't come up into the eyes of your understanding until you quiet down and you start meditating. Then he'll start shoveling it to you and you'll start seeing what you prayed in tongues maybe a week ago. You see what I'm saying? The idea is when you do... How many of you ever know what a siphon is? Anybody here besides me ever tried to siphon gas? Yeah. Yeah. But you can siphon water, you know, and little things. A siphon, siphoning is a principle that works. Praying in tongues is a siphon. When you pray in tongues, you're sucking out of the realm of the spirit insight. And you're not picking up on it right or not, but you just keep on doing it. Keep on doing it, and it's sucking this glory up, and then it begins to fill you up, and then all of a sudden, your synopsis in your thinking starts to come alive, and you start realizing things. And then if you're wise enough, you'll remember me preaching this. This is probably what you were praying in tongues a week ago about. Didn't even know what you're covering, but you just decided you were going to pray a little longer in tongues. Suddenly, all of you are getting this insight to the word, and you're finding out things, and you're going, whoa, what, what have I done? Well, you prayed all that in the Spirit, and you spoke mysteries in the Spirit. But your mind has to understand by the Spirit. So the Spirit has to teach your mind what you spoke in the Spirit. So if you can focus on God and not be immature and let your mind flutter about all the time, God will start letting you in on those intimacies that we need to know, that each one of us need to know for a successful walk. Well, tonight, did you get something out of that? God bless you for coming into the garage.